structure of support because of what's going on now. And it's interesting to see uh, the changing dynamics and the like renewed uh, forms of solidarity um, at family level um, because of the crisis. Um, yeah. um, I mean, in Estrada's story, it's interesting that at every, I mean, she was sort of willing to do everything but cut ties with her family completely, of course. And so even, you know, she's sort of doing one of the more extreme things of trying to move in with a bunch of friends who are boys and girls in, in a single apartment. And that's um, pretty unheard of still in, in, in a place like Cairo. Um, but she wanted to maintain her ties to her family. And, and it was something that was very important um, and, an, and an important piece of her life and identity, um, even though she felt very different. Um, I feel there's an interesting relationship between um, some of the social changes um, and a kind of backlash against, that, that I think remains peripheral, it's not a mainstream thing, but a backlash against um, religious conservatism. Um, and it's also related to sort of some of the transformations that happened with the revolution and the Muslim Brotherhood coming to power and then them sort of, a lot of people in that time sort of who were interested in the and that sort of Islamic experience in politics became very disillusioned from within um, mm -hmm. that wave, um, and and um, and went to the extreme opposite. So it sort of drove people into two extremes, you know, more radical or or just more like done and, and fed up with religion, mm -hmm. and and that's sort of part of the Isra narrative. And in that in that backlash uh, socially, it sort of expressed itself in several things one of which is younger women and many women, older women, taking off the veil. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's pretty no noticeable only because it's a very physical and visible thing. So you see and you encounter it. And, and that's part of the reason that I went looking to kind of tell a story like Asra's because there's so many women um, who are like her. Um, and and she's, she's defiant and she's also not from a privileged class where she can afford to be like, do whatever she wants or she doesn't really have a lot of privilege in life. And so it was surprising to me that someone like her would actually stand up mm -hmm. um, um, and, and, and fight for, for something like that um, and, and, and do away with things like her reputation and her neighborhood. And so there's an interesting kind of relationship there, I think, between religion and, and feminism mm -hmm. and social change and, and the revolution. Yeah, to pick up on this, I mean, we cannot deny that this society now is in a transformation phase after what happened. So I mean, there are people who are redefining the family relationship or what is the relatedness for them. Is it the family? Is it the biological tie or not? I mean, we cannot generalize because some people, like Isra, could decide to have an alternative. Some people, no. Because the family, by the end, I mean, this is worldwide, not only Egypt, too, seem as an exotic space or exotic culture, but it's not. I mean, by the end, it's like the family tie, something that is socially constructed. We all are born in families. We are trying to be related to someone. So I mean, the story of the woman I'm telling, I believe I'm not, I'm not in a position to say that they are in a process of, or in, of emancipation or in a process of being repre repressed or oppressed. But at the same time, this is their, they are trying to making their life work, right? So I mean, it's like they have a family, so they are trying to make the best to make their life a story a story and for their own right so and this is something related to us right but at the same time i have another thing that we relate also to the political economy i mean now in this in this within all of what in all of what's happening around the world there is a real sense of estrangement and this sense of estrangement is what making people actually try to find ties that is actually considered to be nationalist, considered to be fascist, considered to be all of what we are seeing now, even in the US, not only in Egypt, in Turkey, I mean, in Greece, in Mexico, in Brazil now, I mean, we are in a crisis. So I mean, there is something also about the political economy of the everyday itself, like those mm -hmm. women mm -hmm. are selling their products and they are facing those gentrified places on their everyday. They are meeting with all of those people with those fancy cars, I mean, the, the gap which neoliberalism created between this, but like I'm, I'm doing it geographically, like in my mind, like between the front of the Nile and the back of the core of the neighborhood, it's really, it's like this, it's not like this, it's like this. 
And this sense of estrangement is important to understand what kind of tie we are looking for, all of us. Not only, I mean, we in Egypt now, I mean, many of us, I mean, speaking of myself about it, as a PhD student, it's like, yeah, I'm trying to find an intellectual community, as Nina is speaking about, and we are trying to, like, it's a circle, and we feel it's our circle that will save us after the revolution because we don't have any other spaces. Mm -hmm. I mean, we feel that our timeline on Facebook, this is our life, because this is the only place I can write my opinion, even if maybe we will be arrested, I mean, with all of those. I mean, playing, chasing with the government all the time, so yeah. So, we'll open it up for any questions from you guys, and we have mics, although I think the room is small enough that you can project. showing something that's outrageous, you know, and, um, or, or political dissent in any way, or some underground cell, you know. But it was such a gamble um, for everyone who was involved. It was such a gamble for Isra and her friends to appear, mm -hmm. to, you know, just kind of speak in their own voices. Um, and, and, and part of that is obviously that there, you know, there's a lot of taboo subjects and a taboo kind of life that they're living. But also just the uncertainty of, um, of, of you don't know what could happen. Like there, you don't even know when the law will be applied, or which law will be applied, or what you could get arrested for, um, or what could piss someone off enough to do something. Um, and so the, the the twist in her life was she was at some rock concert and she she wasn't like out there to you know, protest or do anything. Um, but it was the band, the lead singer uh, was openly gay. It's a uh, and and she just like she was with a group of friends, and someone had a flag, and they like you know a pride flag, and they raised it, and she was like up on someone's shoulders, and she like put it up, and like a friend took a picture, and then she took the picture, she posted it on Facebook, her mm -hmm. timeline, um, where she's free to express herself and just spoke about like you know something about everyone's right to be who they are and like some kind of broad statement and and that and and she and like maybe a few other people did that and and it, it people found it enraging enough that it became such a hot topic on television and like how could these kids like advocate for this kind of stuff and like this is outrageous enough to uh to to have the government sort of launch this campaign of arrest um and 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 it's called like inciting debauchery, you know, because um, of, of that moment, you know, where she acted the way she acted. And luckily when they knocked on her door, she was not home and she went into hiding. She lost her job. She had to move out of the apartment. She lost her salary. She, the silver lining is that her family was sort of now almost um, kind of forgave her for everything that she was doing and just wanted her to be well and happy and, and it kind of made them closer. Um, and somehow, ironically, more accepting of who she is um, because she was threatened in that way. Um, but it also meant that she, she became very lonely and, and for, for a long time she, um, she kind of had no prospect of you know, getting her life back together. And so, and here's another twist for you, so she's now married to Ali, who's her boyfriend. Oh. And, um, and how is that working out? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 
I don't know the answer to that. They, they, you know, um, the relationship is a bit of a roller coaster, and, and, and so it continues to be that way. But it's sort of again one of these things that makes you wonder. Um, you know, she was faced with very difficult circumstances, and and he showed up for her. And it also comes back to the very first statement she makes, kind of in the in the, in the film, which is like, you know, I don't I don't have to get married to like be the you know independent to be who I want to be. But in some ways, it, it could have been a way out. It could have been something that just made her life this much easier, and she 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 went for it. But she also loves him, and you know, and she's changing, and she's young, and you know, life is taking its course. So it's it's just an interesting sort of. Um, but she's still in hiding, or not? The case is she's she 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 isn't. She's not now. Um, mm -hmm. The 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 case is still unresolved, mm -hmm. which means that she still feels threatened. Um, it hasn't been dismissed, uh, and it hasn't been she hasn't been formally charged. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of hanging over her. So she's you know she's sort of prepared to either confront the charges, and you know her plan would be to kind of leave Egypt if she had to like escape. Or she's just going to continue to kind of lo lay low and, and, and mm -hmm. see what happens. But it also means that it's, it's, it's you know, again, kind of, um, uh, she's, she's not able to be out there. She's not able to do her human rights work. She's not able, you know, it has effectively, you know, um, oppressed her or oppressed her work, oppressed mm -hmm. her desire to sort of be an advocate for human rights. So, you know, it's, it's, it's restrained her um, without necessarily putting her behind bars. Actually, when I first started, they were women that were from the upper classes, often journalists, in fact, who I was being interviewed f for various things, and we would just wind up talking and talking, and then they would tell me their stories. But when I started the actual project, I started in the AUC community and in the community around Townhouse Gallery. So it was a kind of, and Townhouse is located in Tahir Square in a kind of, in the downtown area. And so they were already more, in quotes, bohemian people. And so they were much more um, familiar with Western culture, actually, in a certain way. Than, so they were very open about their situations. As I moved further and further out, and I, I moved out, as I think I mentioned, because I would meet one person, and that would lead to another, and another, and another, we would often have to spend a longer time getting to the kernel of truth or the story that they wanted to talk about or, or what they really wanted to talk about, which was we would often go back and do more and more interviews depending on the, the people involved. And sometimes it wouldn't work at all. I mean, there were some interviews where the person would just clam up and, and not want to talk. But I didn't have a consistent set of questions. And I didn't have other people doing the interview. How the interviewing worked is that I had a microphone only and a tape recorder, and we passed the microphone around. And the translation was, this is hard on the translators, but they would translate both in, into English and Arabic, and we would talk back and forth. And I also discovered that a lot of it depended on the translator, whether or not the translator could make a connection or whether I could make a connection. And if I could make a connection, then we had a really good conversation. And if I couldn't, or if, if the translator couldn't, then it just kind of didn't go anywhere. So that, that was a very interesting process of realizing the importance of translation in something like this. There's actually a really good um, piece of writing by Marina Warner in a, a very recent London Review of Books all about translation and the agency that translators have, which I thought about this project when I read that. I think it's in the recent one. There's been a number of books about <coughs> translating and a lot of the issues around what used to be called post-colonialism and, and translating and, the, and how that functions, functions. But I hope that answered your question. Sorry, my voice is still on. What's this? 
for dinner. Sorry if I'm asking uh, something that you already touched on because I can late. But uh, you at Tata Mosfer, how are you? How you continue to produce such quality journalism in face of unprecedented crackdown, if I may say, the censorship of hundreds of websites, including Tata Mosfer? Just the first one. The second one, how you? Uh, In terms of uh, in terms of keeping work, I, I really don't know. They are leaving us alone, so we should ask them. Uh, but I guess uh, but, but I guess or not. Yeah. But I guess um, I, I mean it's just also it's impossible to imagine a situation where like the margin is completely flattened. Um, so I guess there has to be a certain margin and. You know, that's what we've been doing best, basically, to try to operate as much as possible within it. Um, I have a sense that there is a small constituency of dissidents that is still left alone by choice from the authorities, um, mm -hmm. and that includes some of a select number of NGOs that are still doing some uh, human rights advocacy work and research to a lesser extent. Um, and you know, in general, the scope of this work has diminished a lot since 2013. But the institutions still exist, and I feel like we're lumped in this um, in this lot somehow. Um, so that's my analysis. But I, I mean, more than that, I don't know. Um, you know, as we always say, it's a, it's a new blend uh, of authoritarianism altogether, and we are still coming to terms that we are still trying to learn. Um, uh, you know, how far they can go and how far we can go accordingly. Um, the second question was what? The financial? Uh, so yeah, I mean, we we, uh, we work with, I mean, the only way to be independent, basically independent from corporate funding and from state funding is um, to get some grant money, uh, while at the same time also to try and match it with some uh, revenue generation. So we, We've got a lot of things happening. We have some translation services. I sound like I'm marketing for mother right now, so I, <laughs> so I can tell you later <laughs> what we do. But we try to generate our own money to also not to be completely dependent on grant money. And this is very important for us because even though we're very comfortable with uh, the structure right now, because you know there's nothing really uh, like there there's no political money going into the thing, uh, and this is the most important thing. But at the same time, it feels nice to like see like a manifestation of this poetic idea of the your readers supporting your your newspaper. So we're trying to work on that to make that work, basically. Uh, it's not a, actually a question, but more than uh, something to discuss with only as because you show us how women body in downtown Cairo after the revolution is experiencing every possible imagined way of violence. Working class, like 400 meters away from Tahrir Square, are experiencing structural and everyday violence. You, as middle class women, have just experienced the same extreme violence years ago in the revolution. So what's happening? Like now we are facing a, a whole area that is being evacuated physically from downtown. What how can we imagine it now? Like this line of violence while women body are again uh, <coughs> at the front of the fight. Is it the same story? Is there something new? Because violence against women body have always been the same story. What's, what, how can we understand it now? That's a small one. I'm not sure I mean like related, related to talking about Tahrir Square. I mean, we know that now we can't even pass in Tahrir Square, like, psychologically, and I mean, it's, it's harsh on many levels, right, I mean, and, I mean, I hope that most of you know how it looks like now, just like a green area with 
Egyptian flag at a metal post in the middle of it. So I mean, there is nothing, literally, maybe not. I'm not sure, I mean, and it's not about romanticizing the square in the moment of the momentum and the revolutionary moment, but I mean, this was, a, okay, it was a, a special moment. We were there, we were occupying the square, the violence we were subjected to was both societal and political, and we know this, I mean. So, what is the difference to read the working class women not only as the bodies they use, if I don't want to frame it only the bodies, because that's why I'm talking about the everyday violence, that's why I'm talking about societal violence, right? That's why I'm talking about what is a consequences of a transformation in the economic and social life. I mean, not only, I mean, so maybe the thug in the market in Wakant al will not ask the woman or will not treat the woman to take the money from her, right? But at the same time, all the body language, all of the power relations and power dynamics are part of the oppression, are part of, it's a part of a story, right? So I mean, I started my research question because of exactly what you're saying. In the revolution, we were south of October Bridge, but all of the people in Bulay Abu Ala were north of, of the bridge. And it started by coincidence that I was interviewing a man and he told me, Totally different story about Mawqat al-Gamal, which is the camel, the camel pattern within the 18 days in 2011, and the massacre of Maspiro, October 2011. So he told me totally two different narratives, and the narratives I know as a revolutionary body in the revolution, right? So from here, the, the whole question mark started for me of questioning Bula Abu Ala. So what's the difference for this woman? This woman, most of them, or yeah, the majority of them, they actually don't live in Bule, but it's only their source of living, but they spend like half of their time in there. And they are subjected to all of this kinds of violence. So I mean, and it's, I would share some of this violence in my everyday trying to be in the subway in Egypt, or try to just walk in the street, I mean. Uh, this is the lines I see that is combining us or making the struggle common in a way or another. Yeah. I noticed when I was, sorry, but I'm just going to add to that, when I was um, following Isra, and um, it, it was interesting to watch her so walk through her neighborhood, and there was sort of almost like this like bridge. Um, pedestrian bridge that she would cross at the very end that would bring her into sort of more central Cairo, I guess, um, and further away from her home. And it was funny because her, her stride would change, hmm. Hmm. literally. Um, in, inside her neighborhood, she would sort of try to just kind of remain as invisible as possible, you know, essentially. Um, and, and is walking very fast, straight, not looking to her size, not trying to observe anything, just getting through. Um, and I think I felt that as soon as she sort of crossed that bridge, um, she was relieved and she almost, like her body relaxed. Um, it doesn't mean that there weren't other kinds of like, you know, harassment and issues when she got on the, on the subway or when she, you know, took the public transportation and, and she still, you know, felt, felt it, but it was a different sort of way of walking. And I think part of it is just being conscious of uh, being watched or being in that neighborhood where people know you, or reputation, or, and, th and that kind of thing. Um, and it was an interesting, it was an interesting thing for me. Um, it wasn't something that I could, it was nuanced, you know, it's not part of the film, but it was like, I could feel it every time I followed her, and like, we went through the same walk, and I would like see her kind of, she'd take off her jacket as soon as she like, crossed that bridge. Um, my question is that is going to make you feel happy. Uh, it's just about what do you feel about the responsibility of women in Egypt or in Cairo regarding the situation they live? The fact that you can see, for example, that the mother of Ezra, she's more thinking about the fact that she may have to face God for the action of her daughter than trying to make her feel a regular human being who has right and freedom. Uh, so in some way, it's also women who are reproducing a pattern 
that happens quite often and I don't know if it comes from the Egyptian culture or if it comes from being a Muslim but we have other examples like Tunisia where there's way much more freedom for, for women so you've been there many times, what's your perspective regarding that? Um, I'm asking all of you generally. generally. It's not particularly her, it's just that the example of the mother shows how women behave poorly for other women to get I mean it's true everywhere. I mean it's I mean true, what, one of the interesting things like, you know, that's like you know, you brought up the Brazil example, there's a really interesting election happening right now and the leading candidate is one who, uh, you know, his rhetoric on women is very polarizing. And one of the things that people are interested in understanding is why are so many women like voting for him? You know, I mean, it's 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 it's, you know, the same question comes up with with uh, Trump here in the states. I mean, so this idea that women are reproducing or women are doing things that are not always in favor of women exists everywhere. And I think the same is true um, in the example of Isra and her mother. I mean, in some ways. Um, so I, I don't know if it's fundamentally different, I guess. I mean, there is that sort of general question. And that's why, we talk, we, that's why I mentioned the importance of thinking of the structures of power that basically create uh, these perceptions and these rules. So it's not a question of what all the men think of the women and what all the women think of the men or of themselves. It's also how people are, you know, brought to think about these things through structures of power, be yeah. it, you know church, the state, the, 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 the mosque, whatever, you know. And, and I mean, I, I also feel like, in, like speaking about women, I also feel like, you know, it's, or, or, it's equally important to consider the men in society. And like a lot of people in Egypt, a lot of men will say, you know, they're oppressed. You know, it's like sort of like, you know, so it's not, it's, you, you kind of have to also consider the entire picture, I guess, in, in some ways. And oppression reproduces oppression, too. Yeah, I was just focusing. Yeah, no, I know. I'm just saying that, that, saying that there's all these different intersections. Is what I'm saying. It, as in, it's. But also, we can put it in like I don't know. I mean, maybe like understanding patriarchy and mm -hmm. in general terms. If like this woman has all of those subjectivities mm -hmm. intersectional together, the wo the Muslim woman subjectivity who there is a sheikh who is a man who told her mm -hmm. that she should care about her afterlife. So she's very scared about like what about her afterlife? She is responsible of the daughter, but you will find the man saying the same thing. So I mean, we cannot I mean like we cannot say whether this woman has a woman's solidarity or a motherhood notion of dealing with her daughter of raising her as a free human being. But I mean, all of this are intersectional together. Maybe I mean in many countries around the world it will be the same. It's like that's why the example of why women even didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. And they were like, yeah, because she's a woman, she will not be able to rule the US, right? So many women, and we cannot say that they are not feminist enough. I mean, it's not, a, it's not about this, right? But it's, it's about this, this complex subjectivity that the people has that is rooming around the patriarchy as the power, like within the power relations we have. And there are multiple layers of identity. I mean, yeah. it's, it's sort exactly. of like also like, do, you identify, do, I, do I identify as a woman, do I identify as a Muslim, do I identify as an Egyptian, do I identify as a journalist? I mean, there's just so many like competing identities. And, and perhaps in that scenario, Israel's mom was <laughs> favoring her, her religious identity and, and what she knows as such, and, and is, less, is not really seeing this through, through mm -hmm. the lens of gender at all. Um, so there's that to consider. Well, also, when I, I was there working on Cairo stories, when I first arrived in 2000, hardly anyone was covered. And then gradually, as the years went by, more and more people on the streets began to be covered until by the time I was there in 2008 and 9, everyone on the street was covered. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, so it was it's interesting to, to see, you know, that it's kind of going backwards and forwards at the same time, which reminds you of how identity is not fixed and mm -hmm. it's always shifting and the mother could be one way one day and then a totally different way the next day and whether you capture that on the, in the cameras, you know, what I mean, the mother herself was fully veiled actually yeah. at one point, mm -hmm. 
And she now wears, she shows her face. Yeah, exactly. Which is an interesting that. reversal also. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, not like her daughters, but. I think there were two more questions. Um, so I'm not sure if you meant to suggest this, but you were saying that after the revolution, a lot of people ended up removing their veils, uh, almost renouncing religion in sort of a way is how I took that. Um, I grew up in the southern area of the U.S., and uh, a lot of increased freedoms for people is associated with the uh, renouncing of religion, which, which makes like those freedoms not necessarily palatable to a large percentage of the population. Do you see? Do any of you guys see a uh, reconciliation of increased freedoms and um, speech and wants and needs from oppressed communities? Uh, going alongside with religion in the future. I'm not godly. But. I, I did I, I, I don't want to draw a direct connection. I, I don't I, I mean I, I, I don't know that that's the case, but what's interesting I feel is like sort of the uh, political movement generated also a, it generated the conversation around a lot of things, you know. And so around politics, around religion, around identity, women, it it set things in motion. Um, and so despite the political crackdown that you see, and the fact that many people are unable to sort of express themselves politically, the, the social transformation is still sort of, it feels like it's still there. Um, and, 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 and like I said, it's, it's sort of expressed in many different ways. And there is an interesting connection definitely between this sort of sense of like pushback against religious conservatism that people were taking for granted. And you see it in, in a woman taking off the veil. You also see it in the conversation on television about the just questioning some of the most accepted principles about religion, and that's kind of happening more openly and there's less. Um, um, even though there, it's still not widely accepted, but there's less of a pushback or people will kind of entertain the thought. Um, and that's kind of an, also an interesting thing. So, so I see a lot of that happening. And the, the one thing I also noticed in 2013, for example, when the protests came out against the Muslim Brotherhood is that, um, for me, it was very interesting that the conservative constituencies that came out against uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, their main narrative, for, you know, the interviews we were doing was that, um, yeah, we don't want any particular group to control the way we believe or the way we practice religion. And I think that's the takeaway. People want to to do religion in their own way and they don't want someone to come and tell them from above um, how to do it and and you know and that extends to the state and to the current you know military dictatorship and for me it was very interesting and I'm very wary of not projecting you know my own desires or whatever but in the in the rock concert that Mona refers to for which I saw um, had to go in hiding it was interesting to sort of observe the you know the public reaction to you know this very massive demonization of homosexuality and you know the broader um, uh, LGBTQ community and um, and you know it's it was a war that was first off waged by the media by the you know mainstream media the state media and the corporate media and then followed by the state coming in and starting to arrest people and it was very interesting to like go around, you know, and listen to people saying, yeah, but why Why does the state care about these guys? You know, let them be, you know, let them raise flags or do whatever they want to do, you know. And this is for me an interesting, you know, evolution, uh, uh, or at least an in interesting articulation of this idea of freedom. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question for everyone, it's just what you're finding as a medium of storytelling, especially from women, and as all women storytellers as well, uh, is it creating a, a more interesting discussion among people in the US, around the world, in Egypt? Why is this particular kind of storytelling or even journalistic activity particularly powerful? Women are more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think stories that people tell one another reveal a lot of personal truths that you can't necessarily get at with facts. And so I, th I think that there's something in that exchange between people when they really connect that, that makes something new and different. 
And I, I think the stories that people tell one another are really the way of going from one place to another. And the, a, you know, a story, if you, if you can imagine a story, or if you can think of a story, or if you can want to go from one place to another, that's the first step in getting somewhere. And, and I think that's a really important thing to remember about storytelling, or you know, to discover about storytelling. And yeah, maybe I'm not, I mean, but oral history in general, I mean, as a, dis as a discipline or as a tool within the methodology, I mean, it's, it's becoming different. It's, it's really becoming different because, I mean, in my, like, short journey as an anthropologist, I mean, it's like, it was something when you just look to someone in the eye and ask them, how are you, or tell me your story. Many of those women are actually sharing the stories with us just because no one asks them, what's your story? They wanted to be asked about their stories, you know. Whether we are going to portray it in an ethnography or in a video or whatever I mean. And this idea all about of those issues of representation and like even visibility. I mean, I'm sure Manor went through this a lot, like whether, okay, if Isra wants to be visible, are you going to make her visible and be part of this and take the responsibility of not? Because by the end, we feel we are so responsible of it, right? So I mean, it's it's all about this. So I think it's the oral history itself as a discipline. It's it's opening up for us a lot of ways to, to think about it differently, and who to ask and who don't to ask, and why to speak to women, even if, if you're not doing something about gender. So, and, but, oh, you know, while uh, while you know there is this triumphing of the storytelling and people telling their stories and everything, I always wonder from that position of doing media and all of that, you know, how much does repetition and redundancy also lead to a certain erasure of some sort? So it's something to think about, you know, it's, uh, I'm not sure, you know, the volume of stories, <coughs> to what extent is it going to, you know, relieve and change perceptions of that. And also this assumption that people will always want uh, to be telling, you know, to be telling, because, you know, also to be telling is to be able to formulate something coherent that would make sense to you, and that's a burden sometimes, so I think those are ways also to problematize this triumphalism around storytelling and women's stories and women telling their own stories and all of that, it's things to think about, I guess. So, um, that actually seems like a wonderful point to leave things on. Um, so for the sake of time, I just want to be sure everyone can meet and greet and um, have some drinks and food outside. I want to thank everyone for the panel. Thank you. Thank you.